All right. Good morning from Bogota, Colombia. This is uh, Journeys in Podcasting, uh, a summer edition. And we're really lucky today to have uh, John Spencer, who is co-author of the book Launch that came out, uh, I believe, a couple of months ago. Um, and let's get let's just do a go around talk about who's who's in the digital space here. Um, I'm Lola. I'm a transmedia director working in video games and in narrating and doing storytelling in digital and physical spaces. Very cool. So, John, who are you, and why do you get to write the Harry Wong's first days of design thinking book? <laughs> Um, um, so, so I'm a, I was a classroom teacher for uh, 12 years, um, and in those 12 years, probably about 10 years of it, I used design thinking with my students. Um, and then now I'm at a university, I've been a professor for about a year. And, you know, why am I, I, I qualified? Um, I think... I viewed myself not as the ultimate expert in design thinking. You know, there are there are people who have studied this stuff inside and out at you know IDEO and Stanford D School. Um, there are people who have studied the history of design thinking more, um, looked at the movements throughout. Um, but what I think, where I felt like, you know, what I can I could write this book is um, making it relatable, uh, making it connect to actual classroom teachers. Um, and I had that classroom experience. Um, and then the other piece is I've used it a lot, design thinking a lot in creative projects. So um, I'm someone who loves to make stuff. And um, so kind of that combination of being a maker and being a teacher made it um, where I felt confident about being able to write that book. Sorry for the pause, trying to get Joe back online here as, All right. Right. as well. Um, so I know that design thinking comes from, well, it comes from all over the place. You know, when, when I got interested in, uh, I immediately went the historical route. I was just like, where does this stuff come from? You know, I went back and read Buchanan's uh, articles about wicked problems and, um, you know, all the way back to Dewey to find out how knowledge is like an actionable uh, verb upon your environment. Um, and then I, I started looking at all of this project-based learning and seeing all the different shapes and forms and ways that it's being morphed and realized it's not really one thing. So when I picked right. up your book, I, I had a little trepidation. I was kind of like, oh, no, you know, this is, you know, design thinking is already a simplification of such a complex process. Um, mm -hmm. There's so many parts to it. Each part goes so deep. Um, but I feel like you've written something that's so graspable. Like uh, this is something that any teacher can pick up, and um, it it makes sense. And and no one that I know of has really written that yet. A lot of articles, a lot of discussion around it, but I haven't seen like the design thinking kind of method broken down in in the way that you've done it. Um, I want to jump to high tech high, which infuses a lot of design thinking. But I read high tech high. The responses or the reflections in their projects, like if you go to their, you know, the different mm -hmm. projects they published, the reflections are more telling about their school culture and how the, um, they incorporate all these different parts of project-based learning, and I found it very applicable to some of the things you wrote about. So in one of their, um, uh, in, in one of their reflections, they write that this project involves a final performance, which is that much more meaningful than grades. When this project was piloted, piloted in the spring of last year, uh, once grade-obsessed students turned into active, caring learners with but one concern, how well would they do on stage and as a team? Mm -hmm. How do you see your approach to projects, to, to makerspace, to design thinking, accessing a different kind of motivation in the students? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the first thing I'll say is um, about design thinking, um, kind of piggybacking on what you had said is it, it's a really muddled hi history and for good reason. Um, the, the arts and the visual arts love to claim design thinking as their own because you know in the in the as, as early as the late 50s you had the beginning of design thinking and a design thinking cycle coming up. Um, engineering obviously likes to claim it as their own but so do, do does um, if you go to certain colleges and see their urban planning um, that was 
kind of one of the earliest areas that embraced it, which tells me that engineering, business, civic spaces, all of these areas pretty early on started experimenting and developing their own. And that's what I love about the notion that it's like multifaceted and there's a lot of models and there's no one right model to work. Um, and that on top of that, it overlaps with a lot of models. So, you know, the, the, the Buck Institute project-based learning cycle is awfully similar to design thinking. And the publishing cycle, the product cycle, um, the scientific method, I mean, these things really overlap in a similar way to design thinking. And so that was one of the things that um, I think makes it a, a little more approachable is it's not necessarily something drastically different from what people know. It's more about, um, in some cases, making tweaks to the, an existing system. It's not always radically different. Um, but as far as that issue of like the motivation piece, I think the biggest difference I see is kind of moving from thinking about student engagement to thinking about student empowerment. And um, you know, one of the things I love about design thinking and project-based learning both is that students should own the entire process. They should be the ones beginning with awareness, whether that's empathy, um, whether that's inquiry, whether that's um, a, a, a specific problem or scenario that they figured out. But, but it should begin with them. And then it sh they should be asking the questions. They should be doing the research. They should be engaged in the ideation phase and really thinking through things. And they should own the project management. Um, and I remember that it was really hard for me to realize that I had been putting tons of work uh, initially with the, the first time I kind of played around with this, my first couple of years, um, I provided way too much structure for my students and I was doing, I was managing their projects. I was, I was owning t way too much of the process and I kept thinking, why, why do they seem less motivated than they would be? And then I realized, because they didn't own it. Like, even though they were highly engaged and they seemed into it, they didn't take it to that next level of being empowered and owning it to the point where I could leave the room and they could still do this themselves, you know? Yeah, and that, you know, in school culture, we, we have a lot of accountability measures and, you know, assessment is a huge part of that. Um, going back to some of these reflections from the High Tech High projects, um, this one I, I really liked. It says, we truly believe that while this project has many useful benchmarks and worthy assignments must be assessed, it also satisfied those that would rather move away from a grade-focused curriculum. For as Alficon uh, one set of grades, their subjective rating masquerading as an objective assessment. In the book, <laughs> I think you, you talk around this assessment issue. And I don't know if that's because you're trying to reach a larger audience and know that every school culture is going to be very different in the way they approach this issue. Um, mm -hmm. But I was wondering if you could speak openly. <coughs> now that I know you're not a classroom teacher anymore, uh, <laughs> I wonder if you could speak openly about your views about the accountability and the blunt instruments that we, we put into it um, in the form of assessments. So, you know, what's interesting is that, that was a, we wrote a chapter on assessment and then, and then the chapter became, uh, went from like a chapter to, <laughs> to like, it became like a 20,000 word chapter that I was like, this is, this is a book on, <laughs> on creativity and assessment. Like this is not a chapter. So we scrapped it completely. Um, and I think the difficulty that you have is fitting us <clears throat> kind of fitting assessment that you see as authentic into the system that you have to work with. So, um, for example, um, you know, ideally in, in my world right now, I would just give feedback. And that's all I would offer is feedback. So, um, unfortunately, what, what ended up happening was uh, I, I can't. I mean, I, I have to give letter grades. It's part of university policy. Um, at my last school, you know, where I taught middle school, we had standard-based grading, and so at least I could say, I'm not going to grade your project at all. I'm not going to grade you on the process. I'm not going to grade the product. I'm going to grade you purely on the learning. So if your project sucks, that's okay. 
<laughs> That's okay. Seriously, you'll get feedback. You'll improve it. It'll be better next time. There's no. So I kind of ditched the grades in a way by saying we're going to work really hard on this, these projects, and they're going to be essentially ungraded because the only thing I'll grade you on is your standards. Um, and so I aligned the the projects to the standards, and that was their grade. They would have their seven standards. And then they would do a self-assessment on all seven standards of where they felt they were on, on mastery. We would have one-on-one -on -one conferences, and that was their grade. Um, and I caught some flack for it when, when the, you know, a principal said, like, well, how are you basing whether or not they've mastered the standard? Like, what's the evidence of work that you're citing? And I was like, we're not. I mean, it's purely, it's a subjective, like, it is pretty subjective. But don't pretend that, a, a project rubric isn't subjective either. Like it's gonna be subjective. So I figured out a way to to kind of make it work for me. But the the part that is hard is ideally there would be no grades whatsoever. We would just completely abandon the grades, um, and and just give feedback. Honestly. So w when you are. What does that look like? Like, I mean, feedback can come in many forms. Are you working from a rubric? Are you working from some preset uh, designs from a student? Like, like um, what does a feedback session look like? So, so there's a couple things um, that I found to be helpful on feedback. One is um, there are times where a rubric works well for a particular part of design thinking, um, and but those only work well, in my experience, as self-assessment rubrics. So I would use a Google form, and there would be like a rubric section. There would be a, a Likert scale. There would be, honestly, a multiple choice. Um, and I had students who, um, because, they, you know, if you read the book, I mean, the, the backdrop that might not be necessarily noticeable is I, all 12 years I taught ELL. So they were learning English, which meant... We sometimes, I sometimes had to provide language support. So to guide them on reflection, I might have um, a bank of different words that they could check mark to say how they felt, right? Because I'm looking at, at how you feel about it, your self-efficacy, your motivation, your mastery, your whatever, um, your group um, participation. Um, and I'm really looking at both the, the product and the process. But all of that's formative, and none of that is actually graded. So there's zero metrics applied to any of that, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so those were done on Google Google Forms, and those were usually filled out, like I said, um, individually. And that gave me kind of some, I guess, some hard data, even though, again, it's, it's pretty subjective. And then I would pull kids aside one-on-one, -on -one and we would do conferences, um, and we did two types of conferences. One is uh, coaching conferences. And so the coaching conferences were, I would just use reflective questions. Um, tell me about how this is working for you. Um, what was the hardest part? What was the easiest part? What are you struggling with? Um, what is one complex problem that you've solved and how did you solve it? And I'm just asking them questions to get them talking about their process uh, and reflecting. And then the second one, the second type of conference were consulting conferences where they would come to me with a specific problem um, and I would like expertise and help because I am still the expert in the room. <laughs> you know, like the guide in the side is, is still a guide. Um, and so we would, uh, because they're working so independently on, on their projects, um, I would say somewhere around 75 to 80% of class time is spent doing one-on-one -on -one conferences. Um, and in my experience, that worked better than doing a group conference. So, so I know in a lot of places, you would meet with a group and you would conference with the whole group. But in my experience, not everyone in the group gets to voice what's going on. And you're kind of an outsider entering their, like, group culture. Um, and the, the other piece that makes a difference, and a lot of people would disagree with me on this, but I let them choose their teams. And then they would work on the same team the entire year. Because if you're functioning well as a team, um, you're going to do better and better work all the time. And I know not everybody agrees with that. But again, 
I, I, I've worked all of last year, I worked with the same team for a full year and we did great work. And I don't agree with the notion that you have to break kids up every time you do a project. I think, uh, I think a great functioning group can build on their strengths and continue to improve. Yeah, there's a couple of, of build on questions I'd love to put in there. Okay. Uh, uh, this one's more about kind of linear, tra linear trajectories. I up too late last night. I'm having a hard time getting my questions out. That's um, all right. You write that um, we know that school can be busy, materials can be scarce, the creative process can seem confusing, especially when you have a tight curriculum map. Mm -hmm. uh, creativity becomes a side project, an enrichment activity you get to when you have time for it. But the mm -hmm. thing is, there's never enough time we can do better. Um, uh, personally, I, I like the way you you write. <laughs> <Excuse me. laughs> Thank you. Very, very direct. You get right to the point, and you definitely kind of communicate something about. Um, this comes up several times in the book, but there's there's kind of an inner calling, like a call to action. Um, I'm sure you've witnessed the same thing that we've seen, and this this misinterpretation misinterpretation of standards based teaching. You describe it as an as an um, iterative process of taking a skill and repeatedly formative, you know, using formative assessments. Whereas I have witnessed it uh, often in larger institutions about it being a very linear trajectory where standards are taken and put out on a linear map and you just kind of move from standard to standard. Mm -hmm. So the information process becomes really difficult. Um, thinking moves that are meant to be a deep process can become worksheets. Design oh, yeah. Um, a series of steps to finish and get done. You know, we did our ideation. Let's move on to prototyping. Um, <laughs> how do we slow it down? Keep the curriculum from, as Howard Gardner says, becoming a mile wide and and two inches deep. So, you know, I th I think um, I th I think the 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 first thing is I I don't think people realize that they are creating this like stop and go curriculum with with their curriculum maps um, and 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 so you know I, I I've always said like a map should inspire possibilities um, you know if someone has a treasure map they they can go anywhere if you have a if you have a map of a of a state you can go anywhere in that state so this notion that a curriculum map is a is a map it's not it's a rigid route that's telling you exactly where to go and you're stopping all the time and so i would say you know the the biggest problem that happens is you get these curriculum maps that literally tell you you have to teach this standard this day, this standard that day, this standard that day, and it's this very rigid step by step by step by step. And then they stop to assess. So instead of assessing as you go, instead of viewing you know assessment as this verb, it's this thing you take. It's this thing that stops. Sorry, there's a dog barking right there. It's this thing that you stop uh, learning in order to assess. Um, and the comparison would be like if you went on a road trip and you stopped every mile to see if you're still driving that would be ridiculous but that's exactly what we do so I think we create this system where um, it takes forever where we don't go deep where we stop what we're doing all the time um, and I think it's just it doesn't it doesn't work and so when I explain that to people, the, the the biggest thing I hear is, you know, how do you know if they're already learning? Well, you, you check. Like I said, you conference, you do this, you do that. But the second thing I hear all the time is, yeah, yeah, but I have to teach map. And my answer is, like, hack the map then. You know, I, the the curriculum map tells you what standards you have to teach, but it doesn't tell you what standards you can't teach. And so, if you if you have compacting going on or you have layering going on um, you know for example we, we had to teach those big seven power standards well guess what all seven are covered in a design thinking project so if if our project goes for five weeks still covered every single standard but we covered them in a way that was deep and in the meantime one day you might be hitting five standards but those five standards are being hit for two weeks because there's no rule about like we have all these invisible rules about only do one standard a day and so you just have to figure out how to kind of be subversive about it you know write your objective according to one standard they want to see and then have your turn 
I'm I'm giving like long, fluttery like I I I value being concise and I'm like giving the longest answers possible. So <laughs> sorry about that. Can you guys hear me now? I can. Yeah. I can. Yes. Oh sweet. Hey. Uh. So you know one of my things that I keep thinking about as I've kind of gone through this journey the past couple of years of project-based learning, incorporating 20% time more into design thinking is, to what extent are we really asking ourselves to blow past this idea of standards-based learning, standards-based grading, putting objectives up on the board? Because to me, that also signifies that we're not um, putting the learner first, we're putting the teaching and the route first. And um, I don't know, what, what do you think about that? Because I, I feel like the real call to action is to push past that type of stuff. I, that, that question wasn't for me, was it, Joe? That was for, um, for John, right? Yes. <laughs> or, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, we've got audio from Joe Koss, and we seem to have lost um, audio from from John Spencer. So let's let's wait and see what happens here. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure what happened to our 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 guest. He seems to have. Uh, I hope that dog didn't like come and. Uh, and, and chase him off. Um, let me re-invite him. And for anyone listening live, um, excuse the interruption. We're going to deal with a couple of technical difficulties real fast. Let me resend the invite over to um, over to John, and hopefully he can reconnect. So Joe, how are you doing in the meantime? Good. It's been a it's been a rough couple five days here. We came back on a kind of an emergency mission back to Uruguay and found our heater broken, our modem disconnected, and like <laughs> Uruguay on holiday and like just can't get anything done. It's just uh, so I'm at a coffee shop freezing out here in the cold. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny, like I, I never stayed in Bogota during vacations, and uh, I've stayed here the last three weeks, and it's been just amazing. Like I, I feel like I'm, I'm in the city for the first time in many ways. Have yeah, it, the it's, car at all? Have biked everywhere? Um, cool. You know, have kind of seen the city by day, whereas normally we're in these work routines where, you know, we come home and we keep working. It's like let's have dinner and then let's you know read or grade papers or, or whatever. Right. That's um, well, Joe, let's keep talking because um, I, I think John's going to come back. Okay. Um, but you mentioned this call to action. Let, let me send him an invite one more time, um, and hopefully he can get back on. You know, I'm, I'm starting to become so disenchanted with this idea of, of measurement because measurement, in, in, I think, comes right back to the teacher instead of to the learner. And I think the call to action is maybe pushing past this whole idea of, standards and measurement. I don't know. I, I just... Well, you, you know, I'm not sure if you were trying to reconnect when he talked about it, but he said, um, I, I read almost at the end of the book. I got through to like chapter eight and, yeah. and I was kind of like, why is he skirting around this issue of assessment? Is it because it's a sensitive issue? Is it because uh, he's trying to reach a large audience? Is it such a contentious point that you just can't touch it? And he said that they had tried to write uh, a chapter on assessment. It became so long that it was like becoming its own book, and so they just yeah. cut it out. So they, like, cool. like what the next book will be. Um, yeah, he definitely has a, you know those ideas out there. Um, you know, it's kind of that give unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. You know, you have to abide by you know your yeah. culture, and yep. that's always been a struggle. And it's only really been, I guess, in the last six years that I have felt at liberty or worked under bosses that you know have allowed or saw value in a lot of the stuff we were doing where um, the assessment part was still there, but it wasn't the necessarily like the preset driving part of the project where, you know, we were trying to push innovation of technology and find out how it can be a deeper metacognitive tool, how it can be an efficiency tool, how it can be, a, you know, boost collaboration from having these different nodes of input. Um, 
And so those became our objectives, which were embedded in our standards. But you know, if you really look closely, they're more part of, I guess, uh, Henry Jenkins' new literacies, um, more part of what I would, looked at the ISTE stu, uh, student standard. We always refer to that, the new draft, which hasn't really come out yet that I know of. Um, yeah. But they address this much larger picture. Right. I think John's Chris, back, but he yeah. seems to, uh, the dog seems to have chased him inside. <laughs> I, th I think my computer is getting hot. It's, it's like, a, God, how hot is it in Phoenix right now? I'm going to check the weather right now. Well, you can and see, you, we're like in jackets, and, and yeah. we're inside, so, but we're going to talk about it chilly. <laughs> I'm, right. outside in, I'm outside in Uruguay, and it's like 10 degrees Celsius, 8 degrees Celsius. Uh, it's not too bad here. It's 95. I don't know what that is, <laughs> Celsius. Wow. So, uh, 30, 37-ish, maybe? Probably. So, Sorry, guys. Uh, John, I, I want to kind of go back to something Joe was talking about because it's come up a couple of times, and it's just kind of this hero's journey uh, framing of, of teaching, of the call to action. And I, I love it. Okay. Something you wrote is that you write that the creative chasm between those who passively consume and those who actively create. We see it with the students who spend hours watching videos on their phones, while a few bold students create their own YouTube channels where they film, edit, and launch to an authentic audience. We see it with students who download games. Um, you know, I feel like what you're describing is this dehumanizing process that the modern school environment, institution, can sometimes create. And yet, within that, we have these individuals that have this inner calling um, to slow things down and to focus on some of the basic principles of learning, like making it authentic, like creating real human beings. Mm -hmm. where, did you, where, where did you feel this calling? Because probably I'm assuming that like a lot of us, like when you first went into education, you just want to do everything right. You want to do what you were told. You wanted to be the good teacher. Um, where did the call to action come for you? Well, I think so. I mean, I, I think um, you know one of the things you hit on there before answering it. I'm sorry. Like I, I, I keep doing this, answering the different question. But what you said made me think. So. Um, I, That's I love, because when I, I sit down and write these questions, I have a really hard time figuring out what I'm trying to ask. So you can no, I love it. You so you know, one of the things about students like passively consuming is, like, we live in a you know, we we're, kids aren't digital natives; they're consumer natives from a consumer culture, and so like this is called a consumer device, right? It has this connective and creative potential, but. Like kids aren't any different than adults in that respect. Most adults use it to consume all the time, right? Like, so we live in a consumer culture, and I would argue that creativity is a countercultural thing. Like, if you want to talk about we want to have critical thinking citizens, then you're not going to be a cr critical thinking citizen if you're not a creative thinker as well, because those two go hand in hand, and. Um, Otherwise, you just end up as this like nagging critic who never makes a difference. So to me, that that piece is was always a little bit there as a teacher. Uh, I majored in history. Um, I kind of leaned toward the Marxist side. You know, I was reading Howard Zinn, and I was getting into kind of um, Paulo Freire and critical pedagogy and stuff like that. So I always had a little bit of that bent. But a lot of those things didn't really address like the creative side. So um, the design thinking element was an aspect of where I kind of found that like bridge between critical pedagogy and constructivism and those things I believed in. That well, not bridge, but it was kind of a framework that allowed me to do what I what I felt like I wanted to do because. If it's about empowering learners, if it's about students owning the process, then ultimately that creativity has to come into it. Um, and so those were all kind of um, things that converged together um, on my philosophy um, as, as far as what I believed about teaching and learning. Um, now, where did that come from? Um, to be honest, uh, when I was in eighth grade, I had these two teachers, Ms. Mrs. Smoot and Mr. Darrow, who I still know, by the way. This is crazy. I've like hung out with them now on Facebook and Twitter and reconnected. It's been really cool. And they 
had me do a year-long project where uh, it was about the integration of baseball. And I wrestled with these really hard topics about was was the death of the Negro Leagues a good thing or a bad thing? Because it killed black businesses, but it also allowed people to join Major League Baseball. Uh, and it was this really, um, it combined social justice and creativity and authentic research, and it was amazing. Um, and back then, like, I had to use all these tools that were available at the time. Like, I had to record it in a, in a radio studio and cut the tape like this is this magnetic tape that you had to cut with a razor. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that, but like back in the day, that's what you had to do. And um, you know, I did, when I did a slide presentation, I had to like take pictures with an actual camera and take them to the drugstore and had to uh, raise money to pay for certain things. And now I could do all of that on a computer, right? But so the technology now allows you to do so much more, and that's where the tech piece is cool. But what that gave me forever was this vision of what real learning looked like, which was authentic, it was student-centered, it was project-based, it was all these different things. And I didn't have a lens for it, and I didn't have a language for it. That's kind of came in later, a couple years into teaching, but I always had that like seed that was there of this is what it should look like, and that came from my teachers uh, and that powerful experience. Now, confession here, um, the first two years, I was terrified to allow my students to teach, I mean, to learn in a way that I believed in because I was worried that it would cause classroom management issues. And then I found that every time we went more authentic in projects, they behaved better. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, So there was this classroom management piece where I was like, well, if I really let them own the process, it'll be anarchy. And then you're like, oh, no, actually... They're doing quite well. So, I mean, I wish I'd known that, but I kind of taken this philosophy of, like, only push the envelope a little bit as a new teacher, whereas if I could do it all over again, I would have said, you know, screw it. Just start with what you believe in, you know? Um, branching from a couple of things there, you talk about uh, technology and tools in a learning environment. Uh, I taught for... Well, let me start with that quote from your book. that you don't need a makerspace or a 3D printer to do creative projects in your classroom. You don't need the latest gadgets or the most cutting-edge apps. Some of our favorite materials have been duct tape and cardboard or notebook and pencils. We love technology, but the greatest creative asset you have is, is the human mind. Um, I've been collaborating on a project we call Hacking Active Learning Spaces, and the idea is that you don't need an IDEO chair to engage in the human <laughs> process that IDEO espouses. Um, I taught for six years at school in Barranquilla where my, my tools in the classroom were a giant chalkboard, which was amazing, mm -hmm. and an overhead projector. And then yeah. halfway through that, you know, a computer was installed in the room, and, and that was it. But it made me, I think, um, that much more aware of tool in a learning environment, of how to appropriate those tools. And then when I did start incorporating more technology pieces later, I feel like I was much more aware of the leveraging of those tools. Um, mm -hmm. How do you feel about that as far as the level of tech that goes into your learning environment? No, I, I agree. Uh, I, I mean, I think my first two, my first year, my first couple of years, I didn't have any technology. And then in year three, as I started really, like I said, pushing the design thinking, um, that was the moment where we started realizing to do some of the things we wanted to do, we needed some of the technology. And so it was like the technology wasn't in our room and then we figured out how to use it. It was more like the learning was driving the technology. And at first, we didn't have, like, we didn't have any money for it, so I just had to get a bunch of old computers that we ran on Linux. And that was, that was my answer, you know. So we had, you know, we didn't have this, like, one-to-one -one MacBook type classroom and we also didn't have enough for every student but it turned out to be something where students were able to work collaboratively much better um, and it kind of forced me into this idea of like differentiating your space, differentiating your tools, differentiating that kind of stuff and so um, I think there is an upside sometimes of almost starting with less because in my experience like um, if you give st teachers th this amazing suite of tools, the expectation is they're going to use them all the time. 
And like uh, in, in my last district, the technology department would, would walk around and they would go into classrooms and they would they would like check how many students are using the devices, right? And that's a horrible like that's that's the definition of success was are they using these at all times? And that's a horrible <laughs> definition of success because it's basically saying let the let the computers drive the learning. And so you'd have an amazing teacher who might have been using the computers to blog in the last piece, but now they're doing interactive notebooks, and that's not okay. Or um, they're doing uh, building a roller coaster with you know cardboard and plastic and this and that, and they're only using the devices to document their process, and that's not good enough, right? And so I, I think there's a, a downside of like letting the tech drive all of the learning. Uh, going back to these reflections from High Tech High, you see again and again, um, you can tell it's part of their culture to reach a broad a range of learners, multimodality, to, you, you mentioned the differentiation and like using your spaces differently and how tech can open some of those things up, but also how sometimes tech is not the answer, how participatory theater, you know, looking at, uh, you mentioned Paulo Freire, I just uh, read this summer, Augusto Boal, and mm -hmm. I can't believe how much of what we call 21st century learning he encompasses, the remix, the mashup, empathy, um, tooling and tinkering around with story mm -hmm. and grabbing it from different perspectives. So many of those things were there. Um, what does design thinking add to that? And I guess in, in the scope of your book, what I'm particularly trying to get at is the, the part of creativity and the part of creativity through the lens of empathy for others. How do you think that that differentiates? How do you think that reaches a broader range of students? Um, you know, so, I, 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 I guess I would say like th that, um, I mean, I do believe that design thinking can start in other areas besides empathy, but in my experience, when you start with empathy, that's when actual change occurs. I mean, that's when students change as people. And um, I don't know if I'm answering your question or not, but I'll, I'll just tell a quick story of one of my favorite examples of this in, in, the, in the school district that I came from. We were low income. We were um, considered a bad area of town. Um, higher crime stuff like that. But there were there was a lot of beauty in the neighborhood that people wouldn't know if they didn't if they if they weren't from there. So we had an issue of um, graffiti, vandalism all over campus. And they kept painting over it. We did some service projects where we painted over it. And finally, I had a, gr a group of students, about 10 students, who said, we want to take this on as our design project, uh, our end of the year design project. And so they decided to develop a solution for, cam for the campus graffiti issue. Um, they had a strong empathy with the community because they're part of the community. Um, and, I, and I'll say that. That's why I don't always use the word empathy because to me empathy is a really, really powerful word that takes a long time to actual have, actually have true empathy. You have to have a relationship to have true empathy. It's not like a, a word that I use lightly. And this group of students came up with a solution to paint a mural instead. And within two years we had eight murals painted all over campus. And the theme of the murals was just showing the beauty in the community, things that they loved. So there was a, uh, a mural that showed a pathway of, of education, and it honored all of the people who contribute, the, the, from the crossing guard to the cafeteria worker to the whatever. And some teachers got offended because they felt like we, like we were saying these people were more important than teachers because teacher, a teacher was just one slide on these people that they go through. Um, there was another one that showed kind of the history of the community and some of the good that has come out of it. Another one that was very pro-immigration and how immigrants are, are shaping our nation. And these were all themed uh, murals throughout the community. And never once did anyone ever paint over the murals. Like, they were left alone. Nobody tagged on the murals at all. And so it worked. It was a great solution. But more importantly, this group of 10 students who started that they changed. They be be became much more empathetic, and that shaped everything from one of them who is now an engineer who's focusing specifically on solving um, 
the water crisis with immigrants who are uh, dying in the desert and, and how you get water to people who cross the border. And then another person who is, um, you know, uh, in finance, and you wouldn't think like, oh, finance, but he, this empathy has changed how he views how to do finance and how to do it responsibly. And another student who was kind of the lead artist on that first mural who is now painting murals all over the city of Phoenix. Um, and, and everyone told him you can't make money as an artist, and he's a professional artist in downtown painting these beautiful murals. Um, and to me, that's the power of it, right? That when it starts with empathy, they change as people. And I wouldn't say, like, that's not me. That's, that's them. Like, that's the creative process. That's, um, it's not like, oh, the power of a teacher. It's like, no, it's the power of kids being creative and finding their creative voice. Can I jump in here, here for ask a question for a second? Sure. Uh, hey, John, Joe. Um, yeah. You know, I, I have this internal conflict when I start going down these routes of uh, what school is, um, when, we're, when we start talking about empowering students, giving them voice and choice, um, and really letting them run with it. Is it, are we looking for a better balance in this kind of standardized curriculum that we've created with this high-stakes testing environment in the United States? Or are we looking for a revolution? Um, or do we start with the balance and go towards the revolution? You know, you know this, I have this conflict where sometimes I say, burn the house down and build it up mm -hmm. again. Or am I just trying to shine a little bit of light into what I feel true student engagement and learning looks like instead of kind of what you know, sound teaching looks like? Uh, I was kind of curious what your kind of perspective on, on that might be. You know, I, I think we need people to do all of the above. Like, we need people to, like, so if school is a factory, we need people to pull people out of the factory and get them to uh, a forest, right? Um, and that's cool. That works. But we also need people to turn that factory into a beautiful loft where art and humanity can thrive. And I think both of those models work, right? So, um I've always seen myself as working within a system to try to make it as human as possible. Um, and, and by the way, like st st the standardized system sucks, and um, and I rail against that. But the most dehumanizing moments as a teacher came from me. Like they came when I shamed a kid, <laughs> or they came when I yelled at a class. Like I'm not gonna kid myself to think that like the standardized system was the worst thing they experienced in my class because it was me. It, like we, I, I think that on some level we live in this beautiful broken world where where those things are always gonna happen. But um, in the midst of it. I'm a sucker for beauty. Like I think beauty breaks through in the end, and so like, I, I think it's perfectly possible to not blow up the factory and and to turn it into something different. But I think that's really hard work, and sometimes it gets really discouraging. And you go, "Am I just fooling myself? Like should should I just be making something new instead?" Um, and I don't know the answer. John, uh, that. Reminds me of a couple of things. One is I was reading your book. I was I was I was very confused sometimes of who I was reading, whether it was you or or um, or, or AJ. Yeah, or AJ. And um, and I was wondering why you didn't write it as a dialogue, like just write it as the two of you talking. Um, but I mean that's not really realistic. Well, so so I'll say something about that. Typically, uh, so the way the book works is typically on the parts that AJ wrote are really like. Uh, you'll see you'll see AJ. It'll be a vignette about AJ, right? Um, and so just to tell you our process, like AJ kind of wrote his vignettes. The vignettes that are about my classroom stories always have mine. But then that general narrative thread throughout the entire thing, that first draft was kind of the piece that I wrote. Um, and then he came in and kind of edited and reworked it. And then there's just a point where it was like, screw it, I can't tell a difference between who's you and who's me. So it just eventually became this mess of like, uh, you know, uh, like it's a weird thing where people think like, oh, you were responsible for this piece or you were responsible for that piece. But we worked so well as a team that it was like, I can't tell a difference between who wrote what. Um, and we just happened to have a really similar style to begin with. So 
Cool. Sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead. No, no, no. Um, one of the most shocking parts of the book is when you, when you talk about these these rebel teachers. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm going to quote from the book and I'll give you my question. But uh, I, I was waiting for, you know, one teacher says, I was waiting for the line line based professional development. I've never walked in straight lines before, and I just don't feel confident in my ability to teach kids how to do this. <laughs> um, in handing out test preparation packets for a standardized test, he told the kids to fill out whatever bubbles they wanted to fill out and race to the finish. <laughs> they all read novels and said, "You know, this this is this is wonderful stuff coming from a teacher perspective." Um, I re yesterday I was reading a um, Harvard Business Review article from from Adam Grant, uh, how to build a, a culture of originality. And he writes about a Navy officer, Ben Coleman, whose innovations were based on looking for black sheep, iconoclast, insubordinates that these perspectives were necessary for creating a culture of innovation. I think this relates to what you were just talking about, about how school has to be a house with all of these different kinds of people inhabiting it. Um, but then Coleman would also recruit these steadier types, these productives, these lower risk takers, but the balance between those two was needed within the institution. Teaching, I feel like, is a little bit different because we're not always collaborating. A lot of times we're just in charge of our mini environment. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's who are the ones that have to wear all of these different hats of the different types that you talk about, the different types of creatives, the engineer, the architect, the artist. Yeah. Um, how do you balance that? Like, how do we become these individuals that have to kind of be all of these types? Well, I think, so, I mean, I, I do think, like, within a school culture, if you have those, di those different types already exist. The, the problem is, I think, like, the rebel, right, the hacker is oftentimes kicked out or or gets shoved out. Like the, that story of that teacher that is described right there, he was an amazing teacher for 15 years in my last district and I was friends with him. And then in year 16 he had this principal who absolutely had it out for him. He got put on an improvement plan and he just didn't leave. He just left. And he was like, you know what, I, I have a, you know, I have a a, a a medical degree, I'll just go back into medicine. And he became a doctor. And was like, I, I can get oh, I can get away with doing what's right better <laughs> as a doctor than I can as a teacher, even though that was his passion. And that's sad. That's really really sad. And I've seen them leave to go to other schools where, you know, they're, they they end up in these these schools that are, um, you know, a different model. It might be you know whatever Montessori or Waldorf or a private school or. And that's sad to me. That's really sad that um, we chased away a really good. Not not really good, a great teacher because he didn't fit the system, um, and so I think you can have the diversity in a school, um, you know, and 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 I'll just point that out. Like I, I've seen sort of compliance style teachers who, if they're given a blueprint for it, and who if they're given a vision for what it looks like, they're a little reluctant, but they run with something like design thinking or project based learning. Um, and so I actually think it's possible that great teachers can be a little more rules-based or whatever. Um, the problem I see is that the system tends to push away a certain kind of teacher. And there's, you know, the, the hacker, the artist. There's certain types that just, get, that just get burned out or they get kicked out. So I, I guess that... Um, I don't really have this question planned, but let me see if I can formulate it on the spot. Um, a lot of your book is talking about the call to the individual, and I feel like mm -hmm. you're also touching upon these much larger issues of something that uh, Ron Richard talks about in his creating cultures of thinking, of this kind of kind of school culture of like how to instill these things so that they're 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 a part of the school culture. Um, mm -hmm. Call to the individual is great, but that often means that the individual has to kind of be a rule breaker or or the rebel as opposed to. Mm -hmm being a, a, an a adopted part of the school culture. Um, do you think design thinking, you know, I, I, I read a lot in, about this topic and a lot of educators are, you know, saying that there's, there's a design thinking perspective as a school culture and then there's a design thinking perspective as a project-based tool, like for mm -hmm. students. Um, how much do you think it needs to be sort of embedded in, in the way that a school thinks and works? Oh, that's, that would be my goal. Right. I mean, that's uh, you know, we wrote launch to be for individual teachers because we don't always get to be part of that school culture. You know, um, 
And we actually had somebody kind of push back on that a little bit and say, like, it was through a very individualistic lens and um, teachers should be collaborating and, and uh, schools should be embracing these ideas. And I agree with all of that, but um, I don't ever want my school doesn't embrace this to mean I'm not going to embrace this. So that's kind of where that came from. But, yeah, I mean, to, to me, um, it's, it's it, like the, the biggest factor on whether or not it works at a school level, honestly, is leadership. You know, um, do they create a culture where that works? Um, I can think of a school. I'm just going to – I probably shouldn't mention this by name, but I'm going to go ahead and do that. Um, Kent Innovation High was amazing um, in Michigan, Grand Rapids, Michigan. And for about four or five years, they did amazing stuff, amazing project-based school. Um, embraced design thinking, did amazing things, um, and a real diversity of teachers who went from the more traditional side to the more screw it, we're just going to learn whatever we want side. I mean, very on a spectrum. But the leader, she saw herself as someone who it was her job to equip people and empower people and then get out of the way. That's what she did. You, you would never know who the principal was just by walking on campus. She, she was uh, in classrooms. She was sitting down with kids. She was walking the hallways, um, and she was very, like, she just wasn't noticed. She was never in her office. You never saw her, it, it, you know. She, she did away with the, uh, the principal uh, parking spot, that kind of stuff, right? Very democratic. And then they had one year where their test scores dropped down. Now, their scores were still better than the district average, but they weren't continuing to improve. They, they, they were the only school that dropped down, right? <laughs> so because they dropped down, they got a new principal, and she did away with everything. She, she said, this is stupid that in the hallways we have ping pong tables. Let's get rid of it. Um, let, w w this is messy that we have whiteboard paint in these collaborative spaces that allow kids to draw all over it as they plan. Let's get rid of it. We'll get you some chart paper instead. And it just became this thing of small micromanaging. And I watched three of those teachers who were amazing teachers leave that school. And that's all about the, it, it's all about the admin. Um, I mean, that's the culture. The, the, the school that I told you about where I, the kids had painted murals in our school, um, we got a new principal uh, one year uh, after th three years of painting murals. Um, and the first thing she did is paint it over every single mural. She said they didn't look professional, and there was no space to put up our, our data charts in the hallway anymore. Wow. <laughs> right? like, that's sad, but that's, the next that was real. Dystopia. Dystopia. <laughs> I mean, it, like, I'm not joking. Like, this is, this is, this is a reality. And I, it's, I want to be very clear. I don't hate principals. This is not anti-admin. Um, my friend Tim Lauer in Portland, Oregon, he has an amazing uh, Instagram account where he shares this stuff. Um, his school has really embraced design thinking, public school in, in Portland, Oregon, and amazing things happen all the time at his school. But that's that's because of the, the leadership. He's a great principal who empowers his teachers. And, and by the way, I think the biggest thing is the freedom to fail, right? The freedom to make mistakes. John, I have a, a question just kind of about this whole, um, I don't know, complex of, of what we call design thinking. Mm -hmm. um, are you at all afraid of it getting kind of fetishized and tribalized where we kind of just go into different camps and say, no, I follow the D school five steps or I follow <laughs> the... I follow the John and AJ six steps, or I'm more with Tim Brown and his three steps, um, because really it's 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 a process of thinking, right? You want to think like a designer, mm -hmm. and and we can see this trace throughout the last 200 years, or you know, since the Industrial Revolution, or God, maybe even before, you know, um, the history of it. And and one of my concerns is is when we start talking about a new fad in education, is then we want to codify it and standardize it and say you have to follow this to be able to say that you're doing it. Um, right. How can we, is it possible to prevent that or what do you, what do you, how, what do you feel about that? No, I, I totally, that's a, that was one of the biggest concerns in, in creating a framework that we talked about with, with the launch framework was this, this whole idea of like, 
we don't want it to be a brand that somebody buys. Like, right, and people buy into a brand and they're like, we're a PLC. Really? What do you do? Well, we collaborate and share data. Well, you can do that without being a PLC. Um, you know, like, there, there are these things that people embrace, like, we're a small school and it means X, Y, Z. And um, that that is a big concern for me. Like, I, I don't want to see that happening. I don't want to see... Um, People say it has to look like this model or look like that model or look like that model. Um, and, and that is a, a, a concern because people want to take a framework and turn it into a formula and those aren't the same thing. And the other piece is like, go make your own framework, right? Like take take the ideas. I mean, that's what we did. I was like, well, you know what? The, the, the piece that none of them has is the launch side of it. And... I also think that the research phase is really important. Most of the models didn't have that, so we added it because that's what I that's what I did as a classroom teacher. Um, yeah, so I think that I think that's the biggest thing is like make it flexible, make it your own, and remember it's not a formula. <laughs> you know, that's the biggest thing. It's not a recipe. John, in your uh, in your and just for anybody listening. Um, the backstory to the book, I feel like, is in the transmedia of, of John's productions. That there are many video clips uh, in his YouTube channel, but the richness I, I felt like comes out of your blog, where, where you really tell a lot of the the back thinking behind a lot of this. And in a recent blog post, uh, you talk about product goals and, and process goals. And in the book as well, you talk about researcher Vera John Steiner and how they interviewed all of these creative geniuses. And analyze the notebooks of 50, you know, thought leaders, Tolstoy, Einstein, these types. Mm -hmm. And in trying to understand their work habits, it came across a common trait um, that completely dismissed the notion of a singular moment of creative inspiration. That that it's not so much about this idea that I'm going to create this product, um, but in your blog post you talk mm -hmm. about when you moved more towards process goals and the importance of a steady routine. You found yourself going deeper. Um, and the the pro let the process take its own shape. I feel like we all mm -hmm. need this advice. Um, how do you um, how would you advise making that a part of your classroom as well, so that students kind of feel that idea that that process is the mm -hmm. the goal, not not the product. Yeah, I think there's I mean different t things that teachers can do, uh, but, I, but I mean I think the biggest thing is explaining the difference between process and product to, to students and then asking, you know, asking them to look at the pros and cons um, because there are some uh, projects that are very product oriented and people want to focus on the product and, and that's not necessarily bad, like, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to tell students that they should be more focused on process than product if, if focusing on the product is working for them, you know. Um, so, but I think the biggest thing is like explaining, getting them into a conversation themselves and letting them figure it out. Um, you know, when, when, when I would have small groups uh, set goals, uh, some of them were more process-oriented goals and some of them were more product-oriented goals. Um, and, and the best thing I could do is ask questions like, you know, is this is this making you risk averse? Is this getting you? Is this getting in the way of you going deeper? You know, but if I just jump in and say our goals are going to be process based, not product based, I think there's going to be some pushback and not as as much ownership. Um, I want to go back to this idea that. Uh, you know, you're you're pretty prolific. You have multiple blogs. Um, you also, you know, even in your YouTube channel, you kind of put out different different threads. You know, some some videos are made more for design thinking. Some are made particularly for kids. Some are just like playing with words, making videos about the wordplay. Um, how how does this kind of like you know a lot of people are really into this idea of branding their public persona online or making themselves this kind of brand. You seem to kind of defy that. In that you know your 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 blog work is pretty different, um, and then you mentioned I saw in an interview um, that you talk about the importance of online sharing, where the politics of site-based sharing, like within schools or institutions, can can get really political. Um, mm -hmm. Has any of that changed? You know, as as you become more of a your online presence kind of feeds into your physical presence, especially with the publishing of the book. Um, how do you feel any of that is changing between 
segmenting the different parts of your online presence and, and your physical presence? I don't know. I mean, I, I think I really haven't given that much thought. I mean, I think um, I think I, I view like I view that the, those things kind of being connected. My YouTube videos, my my blog, my social media presence. You know, I, I see them as being kind of interconnected. Um, and I see them as being a, a a manifestation of kind of who I am in in quote real life, right? Like this is just who I am. This is how I talk. This is how I write. This is you know these. This is just me in different multimedia formats. Um, I think I think people use the word branding all the time and, and um, I always say I'm gonna get off on a different tangent here just a heads up. Um, <laughs> I always see a difference between a brand and a craft and to me uh, uh, an artist has a craft and that's their style. Uh, there's a difference between self-marketing and self-expression you know it's the difference between viewing it as an audience and then versus viewing it as a community. Um, there's a difference between um, you know trying to um, uh, trying to sell versus trying to reach you know and, and, and those two things are very different the, the, the notion of a craft versus a brand. Um, I, I almost kind of view it as a t-chart where they're, they're very different and so even if you're like selling something um, the way you do it is just going to be different between branding and selling. Um, you know, people talk about like this is this is your. Somebody said, "Well, John, you you brand. You have this this style that fits." And I was like, "I also have a style in how I dress, and I don't call that branding, right? Like, it's your style. It's it's your craft. It's not your it's not your brand." And so I always cringe a little bit at the whole concept of branding, um, personal branding, having students branding. Um, because I, th I, I view it much more as being a craft and not a, not a brand. Um, and some people, I know a lot of people who love the branding metaphor, like AJ, who I'm good friends with, embraces the concept of a brand. And I'm like, I'm, I'm not a brand. I don't brand. Like, this is, this is not my thing. Um, so I guess the whole notion of physical space, um, online space, I kind of see it, the, the, the two being, you know, deeply connected. I don't know if I answered your question at all, by the way. Well, I'm not, I'm not even sure if I, I, I framed that question very well, but I was more interested in just kind of how you thought about or, or why you, you know, um, used it. I, I also do the same thing. I mean, I have multiple Twitter accounts. Um, Facebook probably doesn't know this, but I have a couple of Facebook accounts. Like, I think it's okay to have these different ways of crafting out there and different ways of expression to different audiences. You know, if you mm -hmm. follow this blog, it means that you're into this kind of thinking. If you yeah. follow my photo site or whatever, you know, like those audiences that don't necessarily even need to cross. And so that's kind of what I, what I try to get at in that is that it's okay to kind of like, ha you know, target different audiences for different ways of throwing yourself out there. That um, makes sense. I guess. I mean, I, I, to, to me, I, I, I never really thought about it. It just seemed like the very natural thing to do is, is like, oh, well, I don't want my school friends don't need to see the party pictures from last weekend on this Facebook account. So that's, that's <laughs> a professional account. Um, so, I mean, to me, it's not hiding anything. It's just kind of like curating yourself, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, we do all the time, right? Like the, Like the... The me that shows up at a conference is very different than the me that shows up at, at, a, at a family party. You know, like those things are gonna. We do this in real life all the time, right? We we segment and fragment and compartmentalize and like it's just what we do, it, depending on our context. And because online doesn't have the same physical context, we have to like carve those spaces out ourselves, right? We just talked to um, architect, designer, filmmaker Keicha Matsuda who creates these hyper-reality environments, which are basically just to provoke discussion around what utopias and dystopias of our technological futures and selves could be. And, and that sounds really cool. Yeah, it was pretty amazing, because it really made you think of everything from, you know, you're talking about, like, when you get up in the morning, you dress, you may not put a lot of thought into it, but probably at some point you did. Like, I bought that shirt because I want to craft this particular kind of public persona. 
Like, or I bought that shirt because I want people to know that I don't really think about my clothing choices that much. Like, I think we are kind of making those kind of choices. What he was taking is even more, um, more out there in these hyper reality environments where you know it could be in this dystopia, utopia, depending on how you look at it, that as you approach each other, you can see where you connect. Uh, in common interest, for example. You have this kind of floating cloud of all these words of things that you're interested in, and then as you approach people like these different points connecting, as our social media networks are starting to do for us. You know, mm -hmm. if a person likes this, you might also like this, or you know, when you meet that person in physical space, you go on Facebook and realize you have three common friends from halfway around the world, you know, like this, the, the way that our social medias are slowly kind of directing us in those ways. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. While we're on this on this topic of technology, because I know it kind of comes up in your book, or or even the fact that it's kind of ignored in your book. You know, you say like the best resources are your human resources, are the community of learners right there in front of you, um, and you downplay the, this notion of tech. And I don't know if that's because you didn't want the book to be about tech, and you wanted to, the message to be that this is for everyone. It's not just for schools that have all these expensive resources. But at the same mm -hmm. time, technology does open up. Um, I think new levels of metacognition, new levels of mm -hmm. multimodality, where in that process of student thinking, we get windows into things that, that we wouldn't have had before. Um, and then in the collaborative aspect, we get new ways to collaborate and new nodes of input where you know kids can add that collaboration in, in different ways. So I think it broadens us in, in those two ways, in the metacognitive mm -hmm. sense and in the collaborative sense. Um, where do you put your... Uh, tech use as far as like expanding the classroom in those ways? You know, I think uh, the way I kind of see it is, um, you know, I, I kind of view it as what, what can we do that tech can't do? And that's design and create and empathize. Like those are things that we can do that tech can't do. And then I, and then I think a lot, I mean, I, I mean, I, my my role in the university is I'm a professor of educational technology. You know, I'm I'm very much into tech. I'm into coding. I'm into programming. I'm into um, building. Um, I'm into multimedia design. So I'm definitely into tech. And so I look at the future of tech, and there are so many different facets that fascinate me. Um, um, obviously, we're seeing this right now with all the Pokemon stuff. But uh, augmented reality it, we're, is just about to hit mainstream. And what does that mean? You know, what does it mean that already a kid can uh, use their phone, look at an equation, and get help and get responses just by recognition? You know, what does it mean that uh, translation has gotten so good that eventually it's going to just be this ubiquitous thing that we use as we do global collaboration, where we're just instantly translating back and forth? I mean, that used to terrify people, right? We still have these myths that we hold on to, the Tower of Babel and whatnot. Um, and so that's powerful. Um, artificial intelligence, um, and what does that mean, not for robots and crap like that, but, but in the services that we use? Um, what does it mean that the algorithms f filter our interests at all times? What does it mean that um, the, 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 the places we inhabit are the, are the tools that we use and that social and media are fully combined? Um, you know, what does it mean... Um, so all these different forces, you know, what does it mean that communication is now completely synchronous and asynchronous on something like Voxer? Um, you know, what do these things actually mean? Um, and so I, I, I'm finding myself thinking about that a lot and exploring that a lot and, and, and kind of landing on, I see a lot of possibility for more authentic learning. Like the, 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 all those changes in technology don't terrify me. They they get me actually pretty excited, um, but then also like in the end, what what with with all of those things, what is the one remaining constant? And I would argue like the human drive to make right the 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 creativity that even all of those things that we're talking about that are that terrify people, whether it's artificial intelligence or this and that, are themselves the result of our human creation, and that's that's pretty profound to me. So I don't even know if I answered. I feel like I keep yeah, no, no, maybe I mean, answering questions. I just never yeah, know. If I mean, that, like a lot of the maker movement and a lot of the, um, you know, it's returning to kind of like 
what is this part that drives us to create? It, make, it makes a lot of sense, especially with the dawn of all of this technology around us. And you know, kind of going back to a theme that we touched on before, but I, I kind of want, want, would like you to try to unpack is this idea that um, you know, design thinking has a lot of the radical collaboration element as well, that you treat a group of people as a, as a learning system. And there's a lot of activity theory, a lot of Vygotsky behind this as well. Mm -hmm. um, or, or Eng I'm not sure if I'm saying his name right, but Engström, the, the Finnish guy um, who talked mm -hmm. about chat, cultural store uh, activity theory, this idea that systems themselves learn, that a, a, cl a classroom community is, is a system that can itself learn. It's full of dispersed knowledge. It's full mm -hmm. of collective intelligence. Um, I, 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 know, I know that your, your book was very much focused on this kind of idea of individual creativity, but, but also what is the role of, of that, of, of making these learners that are very aware of what Henry Jenkins and the, the people who write about the new literacies call collective intelligence and call dis dispersed knowledge awareness. So I think, I mean, obviously we, we kind of view it through the lens of uh, collaborative learning um, in, in the book. I mean, I think the implied piece is that they're not working necessarily individually. But there is that whole separate layer of systems, right, and the knowledge of systems um, the 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 biography of an idea, which was touched in a little bit in the book, um, and I think that um, those aspects are 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 are, are critical. I mean, I, I but but I think that those. I mean, that to me they go hand in hand. So I, I'm a big fan of flow theory, and flow theory is really all about not the individual hitting a state of flow because they're awesome but the environment setting up systems where flow can occur. Um, and I'm going to butcher his name, so I'm not going to even say it. So as a theorist, he basically got into that idea that if you modify the systems and make it work, then that's when flow happens. And, and that was mostly for an individual level, but there's been a lot more research on how you design creative environments that allow groups, entire groups, to hit a state of flow. And so that, to me, is kind of, as I think about at the university level right now in my research, um, the, the, the big areas that I'm looking at are, are, are going to be design, systems, environment, flow, and then and, and how those contribute to creative risk-taking, because I think that's one of the biggest barriers still is fear. Um, and and, um, and I think it really is environmental. I, I mean, I think we like to think of like there's a creative type, and or this person's more creative, or that person's more whatever. But it really is. Um, I mean, I think the next step, the next level, really comes down to how do you design systems that allow that to work. This might, this might, oh, go ahead, Joe. Yeah, this might be a little a corollary, cor, corollary, uh, John. But um, you know, one of the one of the things I've I've kind of gotten interested in the last couple of years is just looking at. Um, you know, school as an environment and the architectures of school as, as, as setting the stage for, you know, a lot of the things we're talking about. And I know there's a, you know, Fielding Nier is, is one of the big architecture firms that's really um, kind of reimagining the school space. Um, so instead mm -hmm. of having the halls and walls and the bells and, scouts, uh, bells and cells schedule, um, we're trying to create more flexible learning environments that encourage uh, maybe... Uh, this, these type of things that we're talking about. Um, mm -hmm. Where do you where do you fall in this idea of of you know we need to really reimagine not only the, the the learning but also the environment that the third teacher I guess is what some people call mm -hmm. right the the learning environment itself and the architectures that we build. No, I think I think and I would argue it's not just the physical architecture which is huge, but it's it's the policies right. So, um, I mean, to me. Um, I've I've seen schools that go out and they get you know steel case furniture and they have st um, you know standing desks and they have you know all these different things. Um, they even design a brand new school where um, there's breezeways that are different and collaborative spaces and then those go unused or the collaborative space becomes the place where you time a kid out, right? And so like ultimately that that third teacher really comes down to the systems, and I think the biggest system is the is the policy, because once the policies change, I think you see 
the systems change, the pedagogy changes, and, and that's again where I think that leadership piece comes in. Um, so when I think about you know rethinking the architecture of school, I think a, a huge piece of that comes down to rethinking policies, and, and that's where I feel like we still lag so, so far behind. You know, I, I like, um, I guess it started in the, in the early 2000s, but a lot of the, the titles of books around like ed tech and kind of ed reform took on these kind of uh, late 19th century Russian revolutionary titling like who is to blame, what is to be done, and Will Richardson wrote like why school, you know, like why do we go to these large institutions, and I mean personally I feel like like there is a reason for that, and, and it's, it's centered around this topic we're talking about of of learning systems, of learning as a community of, of learners. You know, the the Readers and Writers Workshop at, at TC, you know, talks about looking at your classrooms as a community of writers, as a community of readers. Mm -hmm. and I, I think this is related to what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. You ask other um, guests of the podcast this kind of very broad, provocative question. It's just very like, um, what what is your ideal school environment of the future? You know, is it modular? Is it moving around different spaces? Is it small workshops in you know, library spaces or maker spaces? Or do you think it will continue to be we all go to this giant institution for eight hours a day or and then go home and do three more hours of work? Uh, I mean, um, what, what is your ideal kind of scenario? I think my ideal scenario would be I mean, truly be smaller um, Local, like I actually think, I actually think really small neighborhood community schools, and I mean like uh, of of an area that's you know two blocks deep, where kids are physically as close as possible together, and then that group within that um, continues to connect. So as people move, they connect. You know, so they can still go global. They can still. You know, I see it as being kind of a, a web where you have your, your home base, your, your tight community that's there, but then you, you can move out to another place. You can go to another area. You can do hybrid. You can, do, um, you can show up to, uh, you know, diverse spaces. Um, you know, that, to me, I think is, is what I would love to see. But, again, those things are, like, shaped by your environment, right? So I, I, I'm out in, like, the most boring – not boring, but – cookie cutter suburb in Phoenix and now I've just moved to Oregon you know and so uh, as as we move to Oregon like uh, if you ask me the ideal space in Oregon I, I, that, that that's going to be a little bit different where you know, the physical environment's different the the climate's different the everything's different you know um, so so I, I I don't even know if I would have an answer for the ideal school like I would almost say that to me the ideal school would be a, a school that moves, like that doesn't exist in one location, and because of that, like, you know, you go on field trips for two months out of the year. You go to other places. You, you visit the world. You check things out. You, um, um, you know, I, I love uh, reading what Dewey envisioned school because I was like, he basically believed that the school completely exists within the community. That it that it's that's a, it's an integrated piece of the community, and I don't I don't think we're there yet, anywhere near there. Um, we still view school as, as being primarily a place where um, you provide you know, babysitting while parents go to work. I mean, that's still <laughs> that's still the vision on some level, right? So, I, I get intrigued by a lot of possibilities, but I don't have like a utopian vision of what it would look like. You know, it would look like what? a magic school bus. Is it? Like with Miss Frizzle taking you on adventures everywhere. No, I, I mean I, I like it. To me, it's like what's happening to kind of restaurant industry, where you know it'll be a bunch of trucks driving around, offering these different kind of learning oh, environments yeah. or field trips and things like that. Um, what about the industries outside of our schools? Um, game designers, you know, people trying to kind of incorporate or design things for students. Lola is next to us. She's a game designer, has created some pretty cool stuff. Um, and we're also looking at kind of uh, this new era where things like Minecraft, you know, these sandbox type games where kids go in and 
create their mm -hmm. own worlds and things. Um, have you had any experience incorporating these or seen like how people are using either gamification or game-based learning uh, in, in environments? So I think in my experience, I found that um, that the best games, like I, I only went game-based when it was uh, simulation-based, right? But that was for me. That was like when I taught social studies. So simulation-based games were really good where it could be interactive, where people could work, where people could um, be collaborative. I think there's aspects of games, game gamification that I kind of bristle against, like the badges and stuff. It's just not me. Um, but on the flip side, like game theory itself has always been something that influences me. So, um, like the two, the two non non education industry things that I think about all the time as I design courses and classes and stuff are UX design and game theory. Because game theory, they have studied and implemented flow theory so well. Um, you talk about how systems are developed to increase flow, right? Every game I've ever seen has, like, people try to talk about, like, how do you create the best onboarding experience um, in a, on a website? And my answer is, like, that's, that's great. But to me, the best onboarding experiences ever is every game I've ever played that, that I played a second time. So onboarding experiences, um, the notion of levels that aren't necessarily obvious that you're moving up to, to levels, that whole the, the, the meat of the challenge and the perceived skill that you talk about in flow theory, um, the idea of the, the uh, collaborative grouping around a challenge. I mean, the, I, those are the pieces of game theory that like excite me the most. Um, so when we used games in the classroom, that was more early on in my teaching, and, and there just weren't very many online or technological things we could use. So it was like, you know, we could we didn't have Minecraft at the time, but I love Minecraft. So it was it was literally things like learning about um, World War One by playing a modified version of Risk, or um, understanding how you would land on a mixed economy by playing uh, communist, capitalist, and socialist Monopoly, and having them negotiate the rules and change it up, which is really much closer to the way Monopoly actually originated, right? Was, was this. So those were the ways that we, that we engaged in, in games. But, it was, but that was it. I mean, it was, those, there wasn't a lot on the technology side because this was, I mean, shoot, YouTube had, wasn't out, even out yet, right? Like, we didn't even have, like, the, this was early on in, in the tech. This was, this was the I'm putting Linux on my computer days, right? So, um, but I love, I love what game theory can bring to the conversation. You're, I feel like you're referring to James Paul G in, in his book, you know, What Games Have to Teach Us About about Learning Environments. I'm not sure I got that title right, but it's that basic idea that the formative is just built in. You, know, you don't play mm -hmm. Halo and then take the Halo test. You, you've completed <laughs> Halo. I mean, like, you, you've gone through all those levels, and it is it has mastered that kind of formative feedback on funny. all those things you've learned. Um, so, so, so can I tell you a funny Halo story real quick? Yeah. My 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 son asked me if we're not we're not Catholic, um, and, but he asked me if we could go to a Catholic church because their music sounds like the the background to Halo. <laughs> 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 we're not gonna go to a Catholic church. You know, we're talking, so, we're talking, so to him it was like like Halo Live basically. So that and was great. Like about this, you know, these the design of environments where you know Halo had an architect, a real architect. Designed all of those backdrops. I mean, that's some yeah, some it was amazing stuff going on. These like total immersive virtual worlds. Oh, they're um, amazing. We're locally, you know, working with some augmented reality environments to create these 360 like experiences. And you know, the human element is we've we've got these incredible virtual reality tools, augmented reality tools. They're already there, and I know there's more coming. In the next two years, I think we're going to see available to classrooms the ability to create completely immersive environments. You know, let's go on a field trip for the next 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think the challenge will be a lot of these things that you're talking about are creating the human elements around these learning environments um, and really understanding how to use experiential learning. You know, like EL mm -hmm. schools and Ron Berger's advice on how to, you know, what do you do with the experience? What do you do before the experience? What do you do during the experience? What do you do after? 
I feel like these will become the new challenges in incorporating the augmented realities, the virtual reality worlds into our classrooms. Absolutely. Well, hey, guys, I just looked at the time, so I need to we, take we, off. That's like yeah. an hour and a half. I wasn't going to say anything, but if you were to say, oh, no, it's like, no, this it's, is it's okay. really amazing for us. Um, this is fun. This is a really great conversation. Can you uh, just kind of, in case we missed anything, I know you have multiple blogs. Can you just kind of run down where can people follow up and get more of the backstory behind the book? Uh, I know you can find the book on Amazon. Um, where, where can they find more of your production? So I would just say, like, the best the best place to connect where you'll find most stuff is on my blog at spencerauthor.com. So that'll that'd be kind of the, the, the place I would recommend kind of checking out different stuff. And um, I have, a, obviously, the YouTube channel, sketchyvideos.com. So if you go there, you'll see all my little doodle videos that I make. So those would be, be kind of the two places I would say to, to go check out. Cool. Any research projects, anything on Google Scholar? Is there anything else we should try to follow up with? I don't think so. I mean, I, I'm working on some stuff to, to publish uh, later on this year, so we'll see. But nothing right now has been officially, um, you know, accepted or anything. Haven't, well, haven't submitted it yet. So, like I said, I, I'm, I'm kind of figuring out my, my research area, research niche, whatever. What, what do they call it? Oh, research agenda. That's the term. <laughs> Sam is totally new to higher ed. Research but agenda, that's what they call it. One last uh, question. So I know you, you, you offer keynotes. Um, what else do you offer institutions? Do you offer any, any trainings, visits? Uh, yeah, so I love, I love that you're asking that question. So I, I, I do uh, keynotes, workshops, sessions. Um, I've done some kind of... Um, coaching consulting where I'm kind of there for, for a day and, and coaching and checking things out and offering some feedback so a little bit of everything uh, and again it's mostly around that that topic of design thinking cool hey this has been a great morning thank you so much thank for, you. for joining us thanks you know, John hope to run to you again sometime thank you so much I appreciate it thanks John okay. see you bye, bye. 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 See you.